I'm the one breaking the cancer diagnosis to patients? I never knew that. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel, Dr. Austin Chang here. So I've been talking about how I'm an advanced endoscopist and all things advanced endoscopy. You guys know what an advanced endoscopist is? Because I barely knew as a medical student and I really didn't know until I was a gastroenterology fellow what this sub sub specialty actually is. And you would think that this has been around for decades and decades, but a lot of it really hasn't been around until only very recently. So today I'm gonna go over things you might not have known about advanced endoscopy. Let's get started. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Dr. Austin Chang here. Before we get started, please don't forget to subscribe by clicking on the red subscribe button below. And let me know what you think an advanced endoscopist is just right off the bat. Okay, so let's get started. So like I said, I didn't learn about what an advanced endoscopist is really into far along into my medical training. But one thing I didn't know about being an advanced endoscopist is that I'm the one diagnosing certain cancers and letting the patient know about the cancer, especially when it has to do with pancreatic cancer. So pancreatic cancer is notorious for not being detected until it's far along. And the reason is because there aren't many symptoms until it's grown to a certain size. So a lot of patients who happen to have masses that are detected on imaging are sent to us as advanced endoscopists before going to surgery because patients need a diagnosis established before the surgeon can confidently take the mass out. So the way we go about doing that is we can actually use an endoscopic ultrasound, an internal ultrasound, where we can look past the wall of the stomach or the small intestine into the area of the pancreas and take samples by passing a needle into that pancreatic mass. And once we have those samples, we can send them off to our pathology colleagues so they can do special testing and look at it under a microscope to then confirm the diagnosis. But what I didn't know was that because I took those samples, I'd be the one conveying those results to the patient. And so oftentimes, I'm the one who is actually conveying that cancer diagnosis to the patient and breaking that bad news. And of course, patients often sort of know that this diagnosis is coming if there was already a mass that was seen that was suspicious on imaging. The second thing you might not know about advanced endoscopy is that this subspecialty really hasn't been along for very long. In fact, the institution I work at back in the early 2000s was one of the first five advanced endoscopy fellowship programs, and now there are over 60 around the country, each of which have about one or two trainee positions. So just to start off, advanced endoscopy is a subspecialty of gastroenterology. So for those of us who go through medical training, we, have, we complete four years of college, four years of medical school, three years of internal medicine residency, and then a three-year gastroenterology fellowship plus an additional year of advanced endoscopy training for those who really want to be specialized in this field. So when people think advanced endoscopy, the two most common procedures that we often think about are endoscopic ultrasound and ERCP, which is an acronym for endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography, basically a long term for a procedure where we can go into the bile duct, the duct that drains all the bile that the liver makes into the small intestine, or the pancreatic duct, which is the duct that drains all the juices that the pancreas makes to help digest your food. Both endoscopic ultrasound and ERCP really haven't been around. Both endoscopic ultrasound and ERCP really haven't been around for that long. About 30 or 40 years ago, these procedures were starting to be done, and since then, the technology has advanced so much that our imaging is completely different. So the scopes have become flexible over time. They've gone from fiber optic to digital. So nowadays, they're almost completely different procedures than what used to be done when they were first invented. So on that same note, needle sampling, for instance, with endoscopic ultrasound really didn't come into the mainstream into the last 10, 15 years. And so to think that in the past, when someone has a pancreatic mass, surgeons go in and do surgery right away. Now we actually confirmed the diagnosis is cancer to prevent anyone from undergoing unnecessary surgery. A third thing that people often don't know about advanced endoscopy is that because these conditions that we deal with often don't happen to children, and so in the rare occasion that children actually have some sort of bile condition or pancreas condition that requires one of these specialized procedures, it's the adult advanced endoscopist 
that actually does the procedures for pediatric patients. We usually reserve these procedures for those who are very, very experienced and therefore will be least likely to harm a child in the process. Yeah. And the fourth thing I want to go over is that advanced endoscopy has gone way beyond just endoscopic ultrasound and ERCP. So for if anyone watching this is interested in pursuing gastroenterology or advanced endoscopy, it's important to know that we treat more than just the bile duct or the pancreas. We also treat a lot of luminal conditions and that includes the esophagus or the intestine or colon. And probably outside of endoscopic ultrasound and ERCP, the most common thing being blockages from cancers. So esophageal cancer or colon cancer, if it's grown to an extent where it's blocking off the actual tunnel, we can go in and place stents to open things up so people can eat again if it's in the esophagus or stool can pass again if it's in the colon. And on the same token, advanced endoscopy has become so specialized that there are sub, sub, sub specialties that are currently being developed. So for instance, there are new fields like bariatric endoscopy, where potentially that could evolve into an entire fellowship of its own. And also third space endoscopy, which involves tunneling in between the layers of the gut wall to do certain things like in the esophagus, POEM procedures, which is basically a procedure where you release the muscle to relieve any sort of motility disorders in the esophagus or in the stomach, and also carving out certain large polyps that you can't necessarily just lasso off. Newer techniques allow certain endoscopists to actually carve out large polyps that previously weren't easily removed and um, sometimes used to lead to surgery and in a lot of cases still do in certain parts of the country where there might not be someone specialized to do these procedures. I'm gonna go into that in a whole different video in the future, so stay tuned for a video on how we potentially can avoid surgery. There's also many procedures in endoscopy just to treat conditions related to acid reflux. So, so chronic changes like Barrett's esophagus that develop as a result of chronic acid exposure can be treated with certain techniques that burn off or freeze those precancerous changes so they don't develop further into cancer. There's also procedures like TIF, which is transoral incisionless fundoplication, which is an endoscopic alternative to a Nissen fundoplication in appropriate candidates who might be suffering from reflux. And basically it's a procedure where it's tightening the bottom of the esophagus so that acid doesn't reflux into the esophagus. And the fifth and last thing is that this field of advanced endoscopy is still constantly evolving with all the technologies and innovation that are coming down the pipeline. And if you think about it, a lot of these procedures came as a result of the notes movement a couple of years ago, where basically it was a whole movement looking for uh, endoscopic approaches to treat conditions that traditionally were treated surgically. Back in the day, they were looking at doing things like removing the gallbladder through the stomach wall and things like that. And some of those procedures, although technically feasible, were not necessarily cost effective at the time but this could all change though and we might see this resurgence in the future there are also a lot of exciting devices related to robotics that are coming out and of course artificial intelligence is a hot topic and has been used um, in various aspects in medicine but it's also helped out with certain endoscopic techniques figuring out which lesions are actually cancerous versus benign so we might be seeing a lot of that as well in the future of advanced endoscopy. With endoscopic ultrasound, there's also certain ultrasound guided techniques to get to places that we previously weren't able to get to. For instance, we can also do liver biopsies using endoscopic ultrasound. I know that there's some experts out there who are biopsying other things like the kidney. There are also devices coming down the pipeline to measure portal pressures. Patients who have elevated portal circulation pressures and chronic liver disease. And this traditionally was done through interventional radiology, but there are also now approaches that are coming down the pipeline um, that allow gastroenterologists to also do the same thing. So all in all, a very exciting field. This is no mystery to a lot of gastroenterologists as we see more and more people applying into advanced endoscopy, but just wanted to give you a general sense of what we do here and things that you might not have known about. So that's it for today. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comment section below. Don't forget to subscribe. You can follow me on all of my social media channels at AustinChangMD, which I'll list down below as well. 
check out my website, austinchang.com. And I hope all of you stay healthy. I will see you in the next video. Bye.